Hello and welcome to another edition of the ONG Strike Zone. It's Brian Fulford, Kofi Hemingway, and Kelvin Rozier back again. We appreciate the love, appreciate the support. Uh, thank you for checking us out on, on Twitter, uh, following us on Twitter and Instagram at ONG Strike Zone. Also checking out the show, uh, episode two, our SWAC Media Day Review. Uh, of course, thanks to everybody who's been on YouTube to check that out. And if you had a chance also to check out the podcast on the BCSN Pod Zone channel as well, we appreciate that. Uh, you can also hear our show on the Jericho Broadcast Networks app uh, on your Google and Apple Play Store. Just go to my JBN or my BCSN, and that's where you can uh, download the app. And anytime we post our shows, the shows will be there. So you got plenty of ways to access it. But most importantly, after you watch it, or even on, once you get started watching it, like you're watching this right now, go ahead and hit the thumbs up button, like, subscribe. So that way, uh, however you're listening or watching, you can make sure to stay tuned in. So how you fellas doing? Kelvin, Kofi, how we doing? It's a fine fam you Wednesday. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. How we doing, Kofi? I'm doing great, man. Excited to be in the strike zone. Looking right. forward to what we got going. All right. Well, look, I, I wanted to make sure that we, you know, we start the we start the show with uh with, with giving some love to the to the people who took some time to reach out. So we're gonna start this sort of our a, a mailbag segment. And we'll sort of do this at the start of every show uh as much as possible and let people know. You know, we want to respond to some comments. I know, look, we I know there's a thirst for doing these live. You know, people think that, hey, we're doing this. We're live recording. We, we wish we could be, you know, as we're talking, we're sitting there, you know, uh, interacting with you on, on uh, the chats and all the other stuff. But look, it's just not possible right now. That, that day will come. But right now, the best you're going to get is go ahead and comment as you're watching. And then we'll see the comments and we'll get to the comments. We even might even be watching it live with you. And we might even be able to comment while it's airing live for the first time. So, but I want to, uh, so the ways in which you can reach out to us, you can send us an email, uh, go to O and G strike zone at gmail.com. That's uh, the email address. You can send your comments there. Or like I said, during the actual playing of the show uh especially if you're on youtube you can write your comments there or if you're listening to it on the podcast you can always maybe tweet us during the show so i'm going to start by just giving a shout out to a few of the people on youtube that responded with some questions and i'm going to start with uh crandon dillard uh give a shout out to crandon who, crandon <laughs> who who asked us uh his comments on youtube he says uh so if the new info is that the vaccinated people are still catching and spreading the Delta variant. How is this process going to help us maintain a season? And, and of course, he's talking about, you know, we kind of talked about uh, at the opening of that show, the, uh, the, the how the Delta variant and just COVID in general is, is affecting all of us, especially in the state of Florida, it's affecting us and uh, how that may affect the season. So, uh, I'll give you guys an uh, opportunity, uh, Kelvin, Kofi. Uh, how do, you, how do you, what are your thoughts on on how this variant in, in the process uh, well, I believe, will affect the season? Yeah, I believe it's it's obviously going to have an effect, but it will not be the effect that we had last year. Uh, the president did come out and say on yesterday that you know, um, you know, 
obviously, if you have taken the vaccination, even if you are affected or if you have, in fact, uh, contract the virus, you will contract, I'm sorry, if you contract the virus, the effects will be minimal. The symptoms will be minimal as opposed to not having the vaccination and having to deal with severe symptoms that can become unmanageable. At least with the vaccination, your symptoms will be manageable enough for you to, you know, be able to live normally. So he's still encouraging uh, people around the country to take the vaccination so that uh, even if you do contract it, which more than likely you are going to come, we are going to come into contact with this virus. It is unavoidable. We're going to see it. Um, you know, so getting vaccinated will cause your interaction with the virus not to be complicated, not to mention um, the testing that comes along with it. Lord knows the COVID test is probably one of the most aggravating tests that has to be on the planet. If I were you, I would, you know, obviously with the athletes to have to go into the building every single day and get that swab up your nose, it's not worth it. Just go ahead and just get the vaccination and be done. You know, and you don't have to worry about getting tested anymore. People leave you alone. Everybody knows. And then we don't have to worry about, you know, the commissioner looking down and saying, okay, well, so-and-so has tested positive for this. So now this person has to now sit out. Just get vaccinated. Mm -hmm. What do you want to add on that, Kelvin? Leon County Schools reverse course today, as a matter of fact, uh, they were making mass optionals for students. Um, uh, but for kids from 12 and under, middle and elementary school is not mandatory. So the, tr the trend is that, it, you know, this COVID is spreading. Um, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a serious threat right now. Um, hospital capacities are up. And as Kofi mentioned, the thing with the vaccine is two things, right? First of all, you protect yourself, even if you contract COVID, if you've been vaccinated, Think the, the symptoms are not as severe. And then also you're protecting your family, friends, and loved ones who may or may not be vaccinated. So it's just the right thing to do. And if we have any hope of having a season and seeing our favorite players and our favorite team play, um, it's something we just gotta do. Yeah, I, I think we're in a I think we're in a good state where I think like like you said, Kofi, the the it's gonna be with us. We gotta learn how to work with it. And being vaccinated allows you to kind of <clears throat> work with with this virus that's floating out there. But I, I just hope we don't hit a point. And again, I don't know what the vaccination rate is for the for the family football team is, or even the volleyball team that's going to be starting up uh, in a few weeks or in a, in a few days. But I'm hoping it's in the high numbers because I'd hate for a practice to get paused because of what you know positive tests so to speak right <clears throat> let me go to another comment from uh the youtube uh montre bennett we got into talking about the the uh the uh the um orange blossom class excuse me i couldn't think of it for all of a sudden because he he wrote he wrote here Florida Classic seventy thousand plus if the season wins out, um, I think he even mentioned that sixty thousand he predicted or he thought sixty thousand might attend the Orange Blossom Classic. He thinks seventy thousand will be at the uh, Florida Classic. Um, apparently, Jackson State has sold out its portion uh, or allotment of tickets for the Orange Blossom Classic, and I am aware that they just opened up seating in the 300 section on Ticketmaster. So that's usually a sign that all of the lower bowl or the mid-level for the most part have been sold. And so now that they've opened up the 300 section or on, on really the first week of August. So what they're saying is we're expecting over the next three weeks, uh, a crowd. So we might, we might break that 47,000, 48,000 number that was the largest attended uh, Orange Blossom Classic. 
Well, anytime uh, FAMU and Jackson State have gotten together in a classic, it's it's really a big deal. Um, so uh, the stadium holds 65,000. I believe that we're going to um, eclipse the 50,000 mark barring some type of catastrophe of some sort, God forbid. But we will have 50,000 plus at the game, which of course would be definitely a win for FAMU, for Jackson State, and all of HBCU football. Right. Yeah, yeah. if you look at the trends with where they are with ticket sales uh, this earlier in, in the season and all the buzz on social media, there's a lot of events around this game. Um, you know, you got the whole Dion thing and, and um, you know, not having football for a whole year, elite bands, everything's trending that this would be a signature event. And, and as Kofi and you all have alluded to, as long as, you, you know, COVID-19 is not an issue, then I do think we have a good chance to hit close to that fifth in them for sure. All right. And uh, one other point, I want to give a shout out to Mary305 for checking us out on YouTube. Uh, says uh, She says, I look forward to SWAC football season and fam, you will have a great season. Great show, guys. Thanks for sharing. And so we appreciate you, Mary. Thanks for watching. And uh, look, you can leave your comments, questions right there on YouTube as you watch the show. If you're listening to it on the podcast form on the BCSN Pod Zone, uh, you know, just kind of take a note of your question and then send an email to O and G Strike Zone at gmail.com, just like the, the Twitter and uh, Instagram handle there, O and G Strike Zone at Gmail. Dot com. All right, fellas, one of the big news uh, events that happened, I mean, uh, of course, uh, guys have to report. Camp is a few days away. Uh, we, we find out that uh, FAMU lost, that we lost one of our, one of our guys, one of our, one of our rack boys. Uh, he is a graduate, though, of Florida A&M University. But <laughs> one of the, one of the all purpose, that's a, uh, that's a uh, Kofi stress voice there. <laughs> Why are we losing Zende? Uh, Zende Ray uh, has transferred the Georgia Tech, uh, and I'm reading a little bit from out of the Atlanta Journal Constitution because I'd have to pay a dollar if I wanted to read this story on the Democrat, and I'm not going to pay a dollar to do that. But anyway, uh, that's another thing. Uh, <laughs> just as much information from the Atlanta Journal Constitution. Anyway, uh, Zende Ray, along with uh, his brother. Uh, who's a safety at Georgia Tech, uh, are now going to be playing together. Uh, Ray, of course, graduated from FAMU uh, in 2020. He played three seasons at FAMU, one as a running back, two at the wide receiver position, really an all-purpose guy. I mean, one of those guys that really could play multiple positions, such a value, almost like a, a, what do you call it, a Swiss Army knife. I mean, the, the dude had, you could put him anywhere. Uh <laughs> Go ahead. You were gonna say, I, I know you. I know you're disappointed in the transfer, but you, you love, you love the guys. He was, you know, Kofi. He was our Luke Jensen. You know, he was our Luke Jensen, and Luke Jensen for doll fans understands what this guy was. He was definitely our utility guy, but he's talented. He's got good feet. He's got good hands, and I think he has an opportunity to possibly play at the next level, provided. He can, uh, you know, get the right eyes on him. Obviously, graduating from Florida A&M University, he is a rattler for life. So I am grateful for the time that he has spent with us. He was with the team when we were 1 and 10. Yes. So, you know, to stay with us through that long haul to for him to finish the course, um, you know, he's playing with the brother um, with, the, with the opportunity for them to have all three of them playing together at Georgia Tech. Um, I understand. Um, I, I don't like it, but I understand. And, um, you know, he has the opportunity to pursue happiness on his level. And I definitely wish him the best. Yeah. Uh, Ray, uh, criminal justice major. Uh, you, you mentioned his brother. He already has one brother at tech and they're already sort of tech is in the running 
for his younger brother, who is a four-star safety. I believe LSU and Florida are also in the mix along with Georgia Tech. Uh, so obviously, you know, you can infer what you want out of that about bringing the whole family together. You know, Ray's looking out for himself because like you said, he has an opportunity to play at the next level. And just, we, 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 we talked about and we'll talk about and continue to talk about how loaded FAMU is. And so for a young man who, uh, looking at his stats here from last year or 2019, rather, caught 30 passes, 304 yards, five touchdowns. But we saw him line up in the backfield at times in the Wildcat. Um, he even played some special teams, if I'm not mistaken. Did he not? Yes, he returned punts and stuff. <clears throat> yeah. So now imagine him getting an opportunity to shine on the ACC level uh, as a grad student at tech and if he's able to to do what we all hoped and wanted him to do for us at famu well hey more all, all the more power and blessings to you as in they and so uh we'll be watching we'll be watching those georgia tech games and and rooting you on because like you said kofi is a rattler uh for life uh any thoughts on the move kelvin of Zende heading to tech I wish him the best. I thank him for what he did for um, our university and our team, the three years that he did play. And um, he's going to be missed. He's he's a valuable piece, you know. Like you say, he did a lot of different things for us. You know, return kicks and punts and ride receiver, wildcat, occasional tailback. So, um, you know, he, he, was a, he was a versatile, versatile kid. It created opportunity. Luckily, we have Dell. And it, it probably won't be just one person taking this role. It probably be a couple of people at a couple of positions. But um, but yeah, I'm proud of him, and um, I wish him the best. Him and his family. I understand. Yeah, yeah. Well, look, coming up in the in our second segment, we're gonna we're gonna talk a little bit about that depth uh, that FAMU has recruited uh, with uh, with somebody who has been tracking FAMU's recruiting to another level, at another level, uh, than most of us uh, do or have done. And so we're going to kind of get a chance to to really talk to him and find out uh, about the depth of, of what we have in store because it's well documented in many places that uh, we are we are loaded. And, and so uh, it's going to be a fun year. We're, we are days away from camp starting and weeks away from that first game down in Miami Gardens against Jackson State, who Jackson State has already started practicing. Now, you guys saw that, right? But Yada, yada, yada. Next. What's, what's the next time? <laughs> I'm just this saying, that, I, this, I was the a little... strike zone. This is, that's for them blue and Let them hey, talk about hey, it. They, 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 they need extra help. Well, I only brought it up in the sense of with us starting camp in, in, in you know, five days behind, you know, I'm, I'm just hoping we're not, you know, Trust me, we right. are not behind. All right, we're not behind. Kofi said it. All right, uh, so with camp starting, uh, Coach Simmons announced the additions of his staff that became effective August 1st. So, uh, you know, via the uh, FAMUathletics.com, uh, the announcement of six new coaching hires or six new uh, coaches added to the staff uh, you've got Ryan Stanchek, who is the co-offensive coordinator slash uh, offensive line coach uh, after two seasons as the O-line coach at Southern Miss. Um, he spent five seasons at Alcorn State from 14 to 18. So, you know, there's a there's a little familiarity with the SWAC. He was there when the Braves won the SWAC East title. Um, so he, he's been there helping some great Cody, uh, I believe is right there with uh, Coach Simmons, if I'm not mistaken, as well, yes. right? Yes. Yeah, so uh, understand, check the Braves. Alcorn State placed 13 offensive linemen on the SWAC all-conference team. And he's also mentored eight HBCU All-Americans. What do you guys think about the co-offensive coordinator role? How does that work? Break that down in case people don't know, Kofi. Well, I think, you know, just from a standpoint, I think – Coach Simmons believes in the power of team, um, in the power of collaboration. And so 
uh, this is an opportunity to have a discussion, to grow the staff and to give uh, and uh, I want to say our coordinators, our co-coordinators, an opportunity to grow and develop into, uh, I want to say, another level uh, to give them that measure of experience um, with, with, I want to say, with a helping hand to help them lift. Um, what people don't understand, uh, you know, I want to say coordinating is a team job. Even if you do have the title, you're still collaborating with your defensive line coach. You're still collaborating with the, the linebackers coach. You're still collaborating with um, the DB coach. You're still talking with these guys and you're still receiving that measure of input. So to have another set of eyes is a plus um, for what you are trying to do. In fact, the Miami Dolphins are doing the same thing on the offensive side as well. So um, having that measure of collaboration is not something that I'm in objected to or would object to. I remember I'm, I'm not opposed to different or outside of the box thinking this is not the first co-coordinator position uh, that we've necessarily seen. And it's not the first innovation that we've seen in regards to this. I remember Coach Joe went up in the, uh, in the press box you know, and at first everybody was like, why is he up there in the press box? Why? You know, and then we started beating people. Then we're like, oh, okay, why well, the coach is going to stay up there in the press box then? You know, we kicking people tail. We scoring 100 points. He's going to stay up there then. You know, so all of that's fine. Um, I have no problem with it. I just believe that Coach Simmons is giving his guys an opportunity to collaborate and grow. Um, you're a big fan, Kelvin. You're a big fan of the co-offensive. Well, look, we got the co-defensive coordinator. You brought up a great point earlier about the uh, the other side of the ball, the defensive coordinators. We got a couple guys that share that role over there, right? Yes, we do. We we have co on both sides of the ball, and um, Coach Smith, who's the linebacker coach, and Coach Sharp, who's the safeties coach. They kind of had some practice of that one game in uh, 2019, the a game, where we lost defensive coordinator Ralph Street at the time of the second half of the uh, a and game because of uh, he got he got kicked out. So so they, they, they were able to work that game together. And I'm really interested to see the impact that's going to have on both the offense and defensive teams in terms of schemes and play calling and so forth. Um, that that is a bit of an unknown. I think they're very. All those coaches are very talented coaches. Um, no, this isn't old. Putting the schemes together, I think they're well, they're well liked by their players and the team, their team guys. So I don't think there'll be no conflicts and egos or, or personality issues there. Um, but you know, it's the first time, so you know there there's, there's a bit bit of unknown. But I'm actually excited about it. I I kind of like that unknown and and we just happen to be experienced and talented throughout on both sides where I, I I think they can be a little bit more um flexible. Yes, yes, yes. And aggressive, right? I think they got some kids on both sides of the ball that can um erase any error of decisions at any time. So so, so it's a good time to be a coach. <laughs> Amen. All right. Um, a couple other of the uh, hires on the staff. We have uh, Shane Tucker, who uh, is now the running backs coach. He came to uh, FAMU after a year at Austin P, uh, where he also coached the tight ends. Um, Milton Patterson comes in as the coach, the defensive line coach. Uh, previously had stops at Fayetteville State uh, and a few years at Clark Atlanta. Uh, he was the defensive coordinator, linebackers coach, and director of recruiting at Clark from 2017 to 2020. Uh, and, and Clark's 2018 team actually was, uh, I believe, ranked 10th in the nation uh, on the defensive side of the ball. Uh, the second best in the SIC. So, I mean, I, I've, I've, uh, we've done some work with Clark back in those years and um, the defensive side of the ball was never the problem over there. And so 
uh, take, uh, there's some, you know, probably that's a large part there to uh, Coach Patterson. Uh, Latroy Johnson comes over as the assistant AD for director of football ops. Um, Evan Astorquiza, I think I'm saying that right. Astorquiza is the offensive grad assistant. And Ayo Bailey Randolph uh, comes over as an offensive grad assistant as well. So uh, two, two young men looking to, to get into coaching and uh, can think of no better no better staff and no better coach to kind of begin that coaching career under than coach Simmons. So uh, congratulations and welcome to all those coaches. Uh, you guys uh, out there watching, you can go to famuathletics.com, read more about their background. You can even, uh, I'm sure they probably have some emails up there. So if you want to just welcome those coaches onto the staff and into the family, you can go ahead and do that there. Uh, let's see one other, well, one, one, one other nugget that I wanted to get to guys before we go to our guest, the next segment, got to make mention of some of the recruiting efforts or not recruiting the, um, um, what's the right word? The uh, fundraising efforts of the, of the athletic department and really our alumni, uh, through the Rattler athletic fund. And uh, so for those of you who um, obviously may have heard, may not have heard, but from about June 10th until about July 25th, there was this strike tour that went around to various cities, counties within Florida, all the way up into uh, Atlanta, Chicago, Houston, Dallas, D.C., and uh, over the course of, I'm just going to do a quick math here, 10 or 11 dates they raised over 500,000 by my count based on I went back and watched the Twitter feed right I went back and looked at the checks from the Rattler Athletic Fund website the total from those checks $538,176 that's how much was raised um, the largest contributor being right there in Tallahassee at over 121,000, followed up by Atlanta, who came in at 74,000 plus. But uh, those, those contributions made up largely of alumni bases, uh, Chicago, Houston, Dallas, DC, Fort Lauderdale, Orlando, Tampa, Polk County, and Jacksonville all contributing. And when this uh, first started, when that whole Rattler Athletic Fund first came about, back in, I believe, uh, 2018. Uh, National alumni president, Greg Clark, uh, helped start that. And uh, I believe they raised over 150,000 during that first year. So to see where we've come from in the fundraising efforts in over three years and a pandemic, three years and a pandemic, they've raised, what, three times as much uh so i mean this this is uh it'll be interesting to see if they decide to take the strike tour to even uh even more locations in the future uh so congratulations and thank you to all of the all of the alumni uh who were a part of that uh you know props to uh uh national alumni president greg clark uh, ad gochet uh everybody that was involved with the rattler athletic fund um, you know, congratulations. Well done. And we'll kind of maybe get into later about what that Rattler Athletic Fund does and what it can do for the university. Uh, speaking of raising funds and needing funds, uh, those of you who are, if you're in the Tallahassee area, you may have saw a very interesting opinion article by Eddie Jackson. Uh, of course, uh, Eddie Jackson, I, help me re recall, what was Eddie Jackson's role at FAMU again, uh, Kofi? He was uh, over communications. That's right. He was our public relations person for, uh, I want to say, for a number of years, especially during the Humphreys administration. Yeah. So, um, so his basically, his, his, uh, his, his commentary had to do with FAMU needing the community's help to fund the nutrition program. And um, 
I, I thought it was a it was a well timed part of you know of course Jackson part of the I believe the two twenty club is that the name of that club yeah. yes uh, Kelvin yeah. and so uh, talk a little bit what's your thoughts on that uh, that call to the community um, I, I get I get from the sense of his commentary and 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 that article was that it is time for everyone to be invested in the same way that you're invested in the other school uh, in Tallahassee. And uh, did I, I think, get that wrong? No, I think that, um, I think it was a bold statement by him, but what I would add is raising money is a skill set. It is, it requires relationship. It requires asking. Um, there's a principle and even a scripture that says you have not because you ask not. Um, and there's a way to ask, <laughs> you know, when it comes to that. Uh, I think that definitely Tallahassee has almost, um, almost, we're almost at the half a meal mark in Metro Tallahassee. So there's a lot of untapped money that is in the Tallahassee area when it comes to um, fundraising. And even when it comes to our ticket sales, there are, uh, I, I can never forget, um, car was broken at one time and catching an Uber ride uh, to and from campus, but talking with a number of the Uber drivers who happened to be even African-American who had never been to a FAMU football game. And I'm sitting up there like, you have got to be kidding me. Like how, can you not be a part of, you know, not even go, you've never gone, you know, that's, um, that's absurd to me, but it also speaks to the job that our, our public relations department and our, our outreach departments have to do to uh, tap into that. Um, this is a sowing seed time and every seed has a harvest. So this is a time to reach out in those communities, establish those relationships and pull on those relationships and demand, demand accountability with it because fam UNs do spend a lot of money into the community, uh, especially when it comes to homecoming. It is, it is, it is unquestionably um, probably Tallahassee's biggest event. So absolutely, I get it. Um, I think that Tallahassee Democrat is a start, but uh, there needs to be a team effort of professionals that are able to reach out in this community and 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 pull from the community the funds that are due to Florida Agricultural and Mechanical University. Kelvin, what are your what are your thoughts on uh, Eddie's uh, Eddie Jackson's uh, uh, column? I think he was just letting the business community community particularly just be aware, trying to raise the awareness that there's a need and here's a, where they can come in and help. And, and, and I know that, you know, uh, the, the Tallahassee community, particularly the uh, South Side and, and, and the Black community have raised their level of giving. You talked about, you know, the, 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 the Rally Avalator Fund and the con contributions there. And also in terms of the uh, nutrition program. I remember in 2019, we had uh, Roy Moore and Piggly Wiggly and, and those same groups, 2020 Club and all come together. And that's how the, the uh, nutrition program started uh, when uh, Coach Simmons uh, identified the need. So, so I think it was for the greater business community um, and um, I would like to see a little bit more structure coming from the university side, right? I would love to see a capital campaign that includes athletic endowed scholarships and uh, facilities and, and so forth uh, um, at some point to, to try to go out to some of those corporate um, person, people and companies and so forth. But, but I appreciate Eddie doing it and, and we, we all got a role to play. Absolutely. Is, is FAMU or FAMU Athletics, are they missing? I don't know what kind of season ticket advertising they're doing in Tallahassee or Jacksonville or, or, or they're not doing much here in Orlando, but but are they missing? If they're not doing it here in Orlando, 
I don't know what it's like in Jacksonville. Uh, uh, what What's happening in Tallahassee, I imagine it's probably more so than our two areas where we are. But should the athletic department be reaching out into those other cities if they're not already? What do you guys think? Absolutely. I mean, you know, um, the Big Bend area, as I just stated, within the Monticello, Quincy, Havana, Wakulla, Mariana, uh, St. Mark's, Apalachicola, Madison, and Swanee area, there's well, there's more than enough people um, to fill Bragg Stadium. Um, that doesn't even include your Dothan, Alabamas, your Jacksonvilles, your Gainesvilles, your Tampas, your Orlandos, um, and with us Lake joining with the Slack, it seems like this is this is the this is the, you you get a chance to advertise and tell people, hey, Grambling's coming. The, the uh, who, who else is on our home on, on our home schedule? Uh, I mean, State, it's, it's Alabama State. Yeah, it, I mean, it goes beyond. It goes beyond. It's it's absolutely necessary. I mean, you, I didn't even talk about Thomasville, Bainbridge, Cairo, Tifton, Valdosta. Um, we pulled a number of athletes, and it's a ton of fam UNs that are in the area. In fact, Charlie Ward's father um, went to fam U. In fact, I believe on that next uh, in the twenty twenty recruiting class, we actually pulled somebody from a Thomasville school. I think it was Thomasville Central, um, which was the first guy that I, I was like, "Wow, that that is powerful right there," because it's rare to see uh, fam UNs be able to pull that, but. If we don't establish those relationships, we don't tap into those communities the way that we need to. And all of them have the opportunity to be uh, future rattlers on some level. Right, right. What do you want to add on that, Kelvin? There's a lot of good people and a lot of good players in all those communities. And the key to selling out home games, particularly in pandemic times when people may not be inclined to travel, get on planes and so forth, is to put you a circle around uh, you know, probably a hundred mile radius where you are and make sure that you're tapping into uh, all the surrounding communities and let them know that uh, you want their support and you, and, and, and that, you know, and you, you value product. them. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, well, again, it'll be interesting to kind of see how the, uh, the, how, how the funding of the nutrition program grows because uh that's with all of the with all of the upgrades and to the facilities and things of that nature it's uh it's uh you, you don't want to skip out and miss out on little things like that nutrition program that are going to continue to uh feed this program so to speak for lack of a a, a fancier terminology uh so let's let's keep an eye on that guys as we as we go and um and, and let's see if if any businesses heed the call from Mr. Eddie Jackson and uh, uh, contribute to, to the resources of the athletic department. All right, coming up in the next segment, we told you we're going to get into some, we're going to go deep diving into the recruiting of the FAMU roster. That's going to be taking the field later, later this week. And we're going to get into talking with, uh, with somebody deep down in the pit who uh, has got the recruiting angle covered. And so you will want to, you'll want to stick around. And so that way you can make sure you stay up to date. Anytime there's some recruiting news happening with FAMU's football program. And so that'll be coming up in the, in the, right after these words, matter of fact. Uh, so stay tuned. You're watching the O and G strike zone, Brian, Kelvin, Kofi. We'll be back right after these words. Support the Black College Sports Network so we can continue to provide you coverage. Go to myjbn.com slash support and be a part of the Black College Sports Network. Tell everybody they can follow their dreams. Have you had your Earthblend coffee today? At Earthblend Coffee, we take pride in offering you the very best of beans across the world. Blended and roasted to perfection giving you superior quality and satisfying and flavorful taste. Experience the world in one cup with Earth Blend Coffee.
This is the Dean of the College of HBCU Sports, Kenyatta Cavill of Dr. Cavill's Inside the HBCU Sports Lab with Mike Washington and Charles Bishop. Come mix it up in the lab where the course lecture is in session every Tuesday from 6 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time on Facebook Live, YouTube, Spreaker, or the BCSN app. As we discuss all things about the HBCU sports culture, including exploring the week that was in the sporting HBCU dash, as well as the upcoming week of HBCU sports. With me, the Dean, the College of HBCU Sports, on Dr. Cavill's Inside HBCU Sports Lab with Mike Washington and Charles Bishop. Course lecture dismissed. Follow the Black College Sports Network on social media at MyBCSN1, the number one, on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at MyBCSN1. Welcome to the ONG Strike Zone. Brian Fulford, Kofi Hemingway, Kelvin Rozier, and we got a special guest joining us in this segment. Joining us all the way from deep down in the pit. That's right, folks. Mr. Marcus Green here to break down a lot of the recruiting news as well as just some general thoughts and observations as we get ready for the start of the 2021 season. Marcus, welcome to the ONG Strike Zone. Rattler, how you doing? Doing well. Thank you very much for the invite. You know, and I've been watching you guys faithfully the last couple of weeks and following you the last couple of years and just really uh, excited about being a part of this program, but also more excited about all the wonderful coverage that you provided for FAMU and HBCUs in general. All right. Appreciate it. All right. So first off, let, let's do a little background here. Kind of give us uh, your, your, your story. Of course, you know, Kelvin and Kofi, they were born and raised orange and green. I'm the uh, I'm the kid from the Midwest, just the kid from the Midwest. That's why he got that old stupid Indianapolis Colts thing in the background. <laughs> that old... I, we're having such bad luck. That's why I'm covering it up with that Rattler hat. You know, <laughs> so I'm hoping a little Rattler magic rolls off on my Colts. But anyway, Marcus, tell us a little bit about your background and how you became a Rattler. I was starting off. I'm from Atlanta, Georgia, uh, Decatur specifically, and where is greater. That's right. And my senior year in high school, actually one of my good friends, his mom graduated from FAMU. So when I was looking at schools, I was looking at engineering, looking at different things. And she mentioned FAMU. And I went down there sight unseen, uh, part of a summer bridge program after graduating high school. And it was pretty much a wrap. And her dad it actually was a longtime barber who owned a barbershop down the street. Those who may have been down there around the time may know of him, Mr. Barrington. And, you know, it's just been a love affair ever since. And so you're, you know, not, I, we, you know, we, we're, we're hum, Humphrey era Rattlers. Uh, when, when, when was your time at FAMU or if you want to relate it to maybe any football time, when was, when was your, uh, your golden period of, uh, of uh, in Tallahassee? I was around that time, as you can tell by. Uh, See, that's why I say, you know, yeah, I didn't want to. I didn't want to throw your age out there because <laughs> it could just be, you know, you just looking good with a little premature gray. I, you know, I didn't want to. I didn't want to throw you out there. Yeah, I'm a Humphreys era Rattler. Came in with a lot of dudes who are life gets better scholars. Around, um, let's just say Eric B and Rakim was still playing. Okay. Uh, somewhere around that time frame. So I won't give it away, but, you know, back in the day, it was before all the time of um, Princeton Magazine of, of the year, but it was maybe a good eight years before that. So I'll give that number there. So I was around the Ken Riley era. Okay. In terms of football. Okay. Okay. Um, so how did you get started in tracking it? And one of the things that, you know, in talking with, with Kelvin, Kelvin was like, you know, hey, I got somebody who, I mean, he tracks like 
every, you know, commit, Every guy that's coming in, been tracking him from years. I mean, he was real. Now, Kevin, you you tell the story. You you were hyping it up, and I, I was like, Yo, okay, we got to have Marcus on the show." So, I mean, kind of kind of tell us a little background on on what you've seen from Marcus and what Marcus kind of and what what he does. So, Marcus is an engineer, right? So, of course, he's good with the information already, and has a you know a neck for that kind of thing. And as we've uh, we kind of met through the pit actually and social media. And from there, you know, we, we would go to games and meet up at the games and so forth. And just like with Kofi and just like with you, as we uh, got to know each other on the internet a little bit more, um, we always centered around the theme of, of, of family athletics, right? And what's going on with the school and so forth. And um, out of nowhere, you know, all of a sudden, every time somebody was uh, committing or, family was just giving an offer and it wasn't just football it was all sports Marcus is like he'll be on it right he'll be he'll be um um sending that information out so people started looking to him to have that information they would call him out right say hey Marcus hey you know if someone slipped through the crack they was like well Marcus you didn't tell us this man so I guess he got motivated he can tell that part of I guess he got motivated he got a system man that's fantastic man and a lot of my information I get from him. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, I would say it started way back. You know, I met Kevin through the pit and through the old meagfans.com. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, just interacting there and actually, you know, requesting to get in the pit and then getting information. And I will say I first started looking at recruiting probably around 2000 because, you know, right near the heyday of Billy Joe, because and this is back before or maybe right around when Rivals started, but of course they were covering HBCU stuff. So I would actually go to the search engine, put in FAMU offer and just try to search there. And it was like tedious. Like now it's pretty, compared to net, compared to back then it's easy now. Cause I use Twitter and the social media. Everybody wants to put their stuff on social media. So I primarily use Twitter, but starting from then and even just keeping track, keeping downloading, whatever articles or who fame you offer it, and then keeping a list there. And then it expanded as we started getting more and more recruits and it started getting easier to look on the internet. And I would start downloading, I guess, the various all county lists and all state lists for Florida and Georgia or any recruits. And then I said, well, if I'm gonna be listing all this stuff, I need to create a spreadsheet so I can list the accolades of the offers that the people that we've made offers to and going from there. So that started probably maybe five or six years ago. So keeping a spreadsheet of all that information and accolades and even some other things in my spreadsheet that I track based on questions I got in the pit because there's always a push, like how many guys we get from South Florida? How many guys we get from Miami? So there's always a question. So I have the spreadsheet broken down. So I have a column for a city, county and things like that so I can track how many were offered by high school, by county, by city, and by state. So I have it all broken down like that. And something I added recently, which I'm still working on, is if I can discern who the coach that actually offers the potential student athlete, maybe breaking it down by success rate by coach you know, okay. in terms of offer. So I'm looking to try to get that, and I'm still tweaking that a little bit. But... It's just been, I don't know, like you know, Kelman was saying, almost like a, a a labor of love. And it can get pretty intense because uh, you can, I have some tracking offers month by month or quarter by quarter, and you can see, you know, where the ebbs and flows happen to come. So it can, it takes a lot of effort to track the information and then go to look up all the information that I try to compile to give a, some type of summary of the athlete that we're offering and or signing. How much has the transfer portal added to uh, whether the whether it's the minutia or just the just the, the work that that you've had to put in, uh, or, or was it maybe just sort of just one more nugget to kind of add to the layers of, of work you're already doing? I was one more nugget in terms of the transfer portal. I mean, we've always received some transfers, so it wasn't that much more difficult based on everything that's happened within the last year and the NCAA's ruling on uh, opening up the transfer portal and then having the transfer deadline July 1st. So 
it's more or less um, pretty straightforward, you know, kind of um, a day, just a normal day at work in terms of that. Do uh, do you have any interactions with, and when I say interactions, I guess I know a lot of these services will, once they sort of get a bead on where a kid is, you've got various contacts, whether it be at the high school or, or as you said, we know that various coaches have certain areas. So, I mean, are you, have you been able to, or do you ever communicate with any of the assistant coaches to just to kind of get a feel for what's going on? I mean, are they accessible like that to you? What, what kind of, how's that process? Uh, I've not, I've sent some messages on Twitter, but I've not ventured to the point of where I would get inside track information that that would be helpful. But of course I would have to, you know, be mindful not to do something that would uh, reveal something that the coaches don't want revealed. Right. But right. pretty much I'll just follow all, I'll follow the coaches on Twitter and kind of keep track of what they're doing. One thing that I've, I've tried to do was um, for whatever reason, my Twitter accounts switched up on me a little bit, but it's supposed to be set up such that you can, when you follow someone's followers. So say if I were to follow coach Simmons, that if I clicked on his followers, it would show me in chronological order from newest to oldest mm -hmm. who he's following. And so at one point when it was, when I would click on that, I would kind of get discerned like, okay, it would give me a little heads up. It's like, okay, this is someone they may be interested in and reaching out to And then I would just monitor traffic to see if it looks like it's something else. For some reason, my particular, my Twitter account's not doing that anymore, but so I can't use that. So I'm kind of bummed out about that, but pretty much follow the coaches and kind of follow trends and see who we're offering. Nice. Nice. Uh, Kofi, Kelvin, you guys got anything uh, you want to add in? You want to jump in there? Well, how do you feel like coach Simmons and this particular staff is doing in regards to recruitment? Oh my gosh. It's, it's amazing. It's amazing. Now I do say I will give um, coach Wood some credit in terms of some of the guys who was actually pulling in. But I think Coach Simmons, they've taken it up a notch. Truly, you can see that in some of the guys that we've signed. And I do believe, based on what I've seen, like the offers and then who we actually signed at least the last two years with the transfer portal and the early signing day in December, I think, and this is just my assumption, that Coach Simmons and crew are looking for kids who are FBS caliber, highly uh, touted and highly talented, who may fall between the cracks between the transfer portal and the early signing day. I think we were signed at least one or two offensive linemen in our class of 2020 who fell in that uh, category. I want to say the young man from Pahokee, and there was another young man from uh, the Tampa area. I believe he went to Hillsborough. I don't recall his exact name right now. I think. Um, Cunningham and Kabir are the two young men, Cunningham being from Tampa and Kabir being uh, the person from Pahokee that fell between the cracks and may have been committed to either UCF or some of the, one of the FBS group of five schools and things didn't work out and the coaching staff jumped on it. Now, I would imagine that uh, going forward, you know, playing their cards, uh, making enough offers to high quality student athletes, including some four and five stars this year for class of 2022, but also keeping an eye out for those who may fall out due to a numbers game who would be great additions for FAMU. So I've seen a lot of that as well. And that has, I don't know if that was as prevalent as it was before. Yeah, Marcus, awesome. Marcus can you talk about uh, early offers, uh, offers being are you seeing more offers from this staff in terms of juniors and sophomores and so forth? And, and what kind of caliber of kids are they, are, are they offering right now? Well, they're offering a high caliber. I think a lot of the hype around going to the SWAC and even the improvements in the field house and having that open during the summer uh, you saw a big spike in the May, June timeframe when they started having tours and when the NCAA finally lifted the dead period, you know, after what was it almost 18 months, or not 18 months, maybe 15 months or so due to COVID and they finally lifted the dead period. Uh, for a class of 22, which are rising seniors, 
I believe I can check, but I believe we almost have 94 offers so far. Wow. For a class of 22. And it, I mean, it's just the caliber is, you know, three star and above. And that's another thing I added at behest that one of our uh, pit posters was to add the, add the 24 seven sports uh, ranking. So I'm adding the ranking at the time, <clears throat> excuse me, at the time of offer, which is something I didn't before. And that's just because I have, I guess, a personal challenge with, with the ranking systems per se. But I do believe we're upwards of around 94 offers for our class of, actually 97, I believe, for the class of 2022 20, with three verbal commitments um, as given on their own Twitter accounts. Let me ask, because obviously the, um, the class of 2020 is a class that, look, every, all, all the great hype of Dion or Coach Prime's 2021 class, well, before that, Bam, you had the number one recruiting class in 2020. Obviously, yes. the pandemic hit, took away a lot of opportunities, and it just had me thinking, okay, going into the start of camp here, you know, I went back and looked and said, okay, how many of those guys from that 2020 are on the roster still around? Because obviously those guys had to sit a year without any football as they had planned. And then you add in the 20, at least as I'm looking at the, the FAMU Athletics website, the 20 guys who came in as part of, I guess you would say the 2021 class, um, you know, by, by my count, uh, there's only 11 of the 18 from the class of 2020 that are still on the roster. Now, and I, when I say on the roster, I'm looking at, I'm going based on this media guy. This one that he passed out the swag. Now, you may have more up-to-date information than me, Marcus, because, you know, information moves faster. This was printed, like, what, three weeks ago. So, you know, and now by my count, you know, Obviously, the more notable names that aren't on the roster, you got John Holcomb II, who's mm -hmm. not on the roster, uh, the Kansas State transfer quarterback. Um, any other – now, you had Trey Bishop, Michael Brown, uh, Radcliffe Campbell, Christoph Troop, Evan Webster. Those were the names that I came across that aren't – still on the ro uh, still on the roster at least going into camp and it, what can you tell us about that you know 2020 players those impact guys that a lot of people were excited about and then maybe even some of the guys from 2021 that might have an opportunity to impact it's gonna be tough this year but if not this year next year I think um, for those seven or so I mean, there are a couple that may not have they may have been offered. And so that's one of the things that we have to watch out for when we have signing day, we have all the hoopla and then the reality hits, you know, people actually have to get accepted. They may have other opportunities or maybe some other challenges. And so what we see in February doesn't necessarily translate to what we see in August. And this is only magnified by the fact that we had a canceled season for 2020. So, I'm not sure, you know, how those turned out. And it could be, uh, I guess, something that we affectionately call in the pit, uh, the black hole, like where dudes come from, like someone may sign on as a walk on or may get pushed down to what we call the practice squad, basically the what we call the black hole. So somebody comes out of nowhere. So there could be an opportunity for at least a couple of those young men. They may not be listed on the roster, but they could be part of the practice squad because there's a certain number that has to be submitted to the NCAA in terms of our formal roster. So they could be getting redshirted or be on the practice squad. And then all of a sudden in 2022 may pop up again. So we don't know. I don't know specifically you know, for some of them, you know, if they happen to still be around and just not on the formal a 95 person roster or if they are truly in fact off the team or not no longer part of the team Kofi Kelvin you guys have any thoughts on the on those recruiting classes from 20 and 21 and if any any kind of impact those guys might make uh absolutely I mean the 2020 class is one of the best classes in recent history um you know, is documented how well 
uh, Coach Simmons and his staff recruited. And 2021 was on par with the 2020 class. So you're looking at kids that are academically sound for the most part, and you're looking at kids, kids that are also athletically gifted. Um, this past class, you could see uh, an intent to upgrade the lines on both sides of the ball. Um, and that's really key to, uh, to uh, where these guys or where FAMU looks to go because um, it's, it's a game that is won in the trenches. And so they did an excellent job of um, making sure that our trenches were sound. But then at the same time, they still got sound and quality um, skill position players. And they added a couple of QBs that are going to be competing for the starting job this year. Uh, with Maritovic and the young man out of Jacksonville. So I think, uh, yeah, the young man out of Jacksonville. So wait, Coach wait, Simmons, wait. The, oh, both oh, the 20. Rewind that back, Kofi. What Rick, What did you just say? You just said there's, say that again about the quarterback and who's competing for that starting job? Uh, Maritovic, who is out of uh, Central Orlando. Florida. Oh, yeah, Wakiva. he's right out of my backyard, yep. Wakiva yeah. High School, yeah. yep. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, it was a QB. I think is it Trinity Christian that just won yeah, state? Yes. Mm -hmm. What is his last name? What is his name? Jackson. Jordan. Jacory Jordan, I believe. Yeah, Jacory. And you anyway, Jacory is uh, good. Is it Harris or Jordan? Uh, let me see. It. Jordan. Okay. Jacory He's Jordan. good. He's and got good, solid fundamentals. He's competitive. He's been well coached. And you really think got, that you really think that they have a I mean, you know, look, let's be real. We all know the biggest question going into camp is the quarterback battle. You yeah, think oh, between, between McKay and Sapp. Those, here's what I will say. Here's what I will say. Go ahead. I think that obviously in a camp, you always give the the incumbent um starters the opportunity to lead. And I think that Sapp and uh, McKay are obviously ahead along with the young man from New Orleans. Um, that's, that's really your top three. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, th things happen. I mean, Brady was not the starter when he went up to New England. Uh, Drew Bledsoe was the starter. And then all of a sudden stuff happened. Bledsoe gets hit out of bounds. Brady's next man up. And the rest is history. So um, I can tell you that these both of these young men are very hungry. They are talented. And uh, I think Rattler Nation has a lot to look forward to with that QB role. We, we have depth. Oh, go sorry, ahead, go ahead. I'm sorry, no, no, go ahead. We Mark. have depth all over the place from class of 2021, just adding to the class of 2020 with, between transfers and, and high school signees. So and uh, to go along with Kofi's point, you know, QB is the biggest question because at every other position, I would say we're stacked. And you can see, once again, as Kofi said, that the line, the last two years, offensive line, and this year, offensive, defensive line, and size. You know, Coach Simmons has really emphasized size. And he said this year at the SWAC uh, conference, I'm sorry, the SWAC media day, but also in previous years, when I believe we were first talking about it, maybe a little bit before, maybe two years ago in some of some of the podcasts, he mentioned that line play was probably the biggest difference that he saw between the MEAC and the SWAC and that it was a little bit more physical on his estimation. And I'm kind of paraphrasing, but a little bit more physical along the line in the MEAC. And so, you know, him recruiting the last two years and some of the signings he's had for transfers, he's bringing in some big boys to kind of get after the quarterback and push the defensive line back to open up those holes and protect whoever's back there taking the snaps. Well, I think, you know, just really uh, it goes back to show the impact of Buddy Pugh and, and Hayes um, in the conference, uh, even Joe Taylor in the conference, because Joe Taylor had a strong running, running attack. But then in addition, uh, Buddy Pugh's teams were always very, very physical, and they still are. Um, they will bust you in the mouth and, and <laughs> on both sides of the ball, and it's always a physical knockdown, drag-out fight. And if you're, not, um, if you're not able to penetrate them, you'll have a very difficult time beating them. 
And consequently, I mean, that's largely why a and has been staked, uh, really been solid. They've got solid line play in addition to their skill position. Uh, they just believe in the MEAC that football is built from the inside out. But if, you're not, if you don't have a line in the MEAC, you will not compete. And quiet as is kept, uh, Bethune-Cookman's uh, line play uh, has been, I would say, stronger than ours. Their players have been more <laughs> athletic than ours. Um, during that period when we were on probation, they were able to get, uh, I want to say, a leg up really with recruiting. It has evened out since, but uh, that's a large part to why we've had this nine game losing streak in the Florida Classic. Mm-hmm. Um, let me let me ask this, Marcus, of you as uh, as we get ready to sort of wrap it up here. Uh, let, let's take a look at that quarterback battle and maybe what your recruiting notes will show maybe you can take us into a little bit of the history in your notes uh obviously we have uh Rashawn McKay uh he is a redshirt junior from Godby High School right there in Tallahassee Florida Uh, and then you got Cameron Sapp uh well let me okay so McKay for for just everyone you know McKay 6'1 220 obviously had a win in his one start last year against Morgan State I believe right Morgan State on the road uh, but also through the game-winning touchdown, uh, filling in for Ryan Stanley in the A&T game uh, at the end of that game. Came in just, you know, uh, off the bench in the fourth quarter, pretty much did a great job and in, in, in won the game with a great throw in overtime. Uh, so that's sort of the highlights of McKay. Cameron Sapp, Cameron Sapp, redshirt sophomore from uh, Jacksonville, Robert E. Lee. He's 6'3". 215 and uh i don't know did we see much of sap i don't think we saw much of sap last year did we even in the even a couple of those blowouts did he get on, on the field no 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 but uh, what i what i can say is that he's uh as they used to say on the six million dollar man show he's bigger he's stronger and he's faster and of the qbs that we have on the roster he is definitely, uh, he's probably the most athletic. In fact, Coach Simmons has said he's the most athletic uh, quarterback that we have right now. So um, he's yeah, going to be, he's going to have an opportunity to definitely compete and knock McKay out of that position. And you already mentioned the other young man who, uh, uh, LeJohn uh, Howard, mm-hmm. a redshirt junior from New Orleans, McDonough, uh 35 high school he's a redshirt junior i'm not familiar what's what's his background so marcus i'm gonna turn it over to you give us a little bit of the background from a recruiting standpoint on how he got the fam what was sort of their uh what was sort of the the buzz for those guys as they were coming in the fam uh well start with the john howard i think he was recruited in uh, coach simmons first class and I believe Prairie View, Prairie View had actually reached out to him the summer before uh, Coach Simmons came over. So this would have been in summer 2017, I believe so. So he was looking at Prairie View, and I think he was committed originally to one of the Louisiana FCS schools. I want to say Northwestern State or someone like that. And then whatever happened, and Coach Simmons came December 2017, and then he popped up on our radar. And... Now, he had some accolades. Both he and I believe Eddie Tillman went to the same high school. So they came in together, uh, running back Eddie Tillman. And so, you know, they came, I wouldn't say as a package deal, but they both came from the same high school, pretty successful. And so, you know, he had some accolades coming to him. I don't recall exactly what rating he was given at 24-7 uh, from that time, but he, he came in with some accolades at that time. Uh, Rashawn McKay, I I'm not sure to what degree. I don't know if he was a preferred walk-on or came on. So I don't remember seeing him pop up in terms of offers that I happen to see on social media. But he definitely showed uh, himself last year or 2019 in coming in the AT game to win it in overtime and also leading us on the road at Morgan State. Uh, Cameron Sapp uh, also had some accolades. Uh, he came from, I believe, Lee High School in Jacksonville. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, they had... They're really, they're always in, I believe they're either class 5A or 6A, and they always seem to get quarterfinals or semifinals and run up against someone else and not make it. But I mean, he had some pop as well. 
and I think he may have been committed to Alcorn State or another uh, SWAC school. And then we came on late and pulled him over. And actually, I believe he is the nephew of former Clemson and NFL player Patrick Sapp. Uh huh. Okay. So he has some athleticism in his blood. And it was okay. it was all corn because they were talking about that on one of the other swag shows. Okay. Uh, it, it was uh, looking at all corn. So, uh, in terms of QBs, I mean, we've put some offers out, and just from this summer, or even class of what I deem as class of twenty one, which would be transfer QBs, we put a few out there uh, for a couple of uh, JUCO folks. You know, so they're they're looking around, and we did you know have someone we thought were, was going to come in during the summer. It didn't work out. A young man who ended up at uh, South Dakota State, but he had originally verbally committed and I guess socially committed, if you will, for lack of a better term, to FAMU early early summer. I want to say late May or early June, but things fell through. Mm -hmm. All right. So so the million dollar question for you, Marcus. If you had to, if you had to, you know, if you had to handicap it, if you had to put a, you know, a, 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 some lunch money, who do you, who do you <laughs> think, who do you think comes out of this quarterback battle? Or do you think we get a scenario similar to 1998 for those of us who remember and how that went down? Uh, very, um, I don't know if it, we can say it's similar, but as, as we were thinking, as I'm thinking about it, I'm thinking, man, you know, for those who remember 1998, I mean, you, we had three quarterbacks, didn't really know which one we're going to go with. Turned out we ended up with a, with a legend in the third game. So, I mean, I don't know if we're going to get that same kind of thing again, but, and we started the season with a conference game. Mm -hmm. if, I'm, if I'm not mistaken, Hampton was a conference game and that was a winnable game. It hurt us, but then again, it, it didn't really matter because we ran off a beautiful streak anyway. So uh, all that said, Marcus, I just threw that out there just to add more complication to the question. Um, who, who, who do you think comes out on top? I'm guessing just from experience, Rashawn McKay, because he's had a start. You have at least a little bit of film on him. And you're going in game one. It's a home game because it's in our home state. But based on whatever sales are on Ticketmaster, there's going to be a lot of people in Miami. And he's at least been in the fire at least more times than that. And barring any last minute surprises this coming weekend when they open camp, I'm thinking he is he's going to be the starter. I haven't seen much rumblings of any quarterbacks and I've tracked 24 seven sports um, transfer portal or their listings because they put stuff out every day of who's who's available or who's made themselves available in the transfer portal. And I haven't seen any public movement for family reaching out to anyone. There may be a couple of irons in the fire, but they were in place earlier in the summer. So I don't know, it's getting late in camp or, or getting late to the closer camp for something to happen now, unless there's a surprise at the last minute. All right, all right. I, I'm, 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 you know, I don't know. Uh, I don't know, Kelvin, Kofi, if you guys wanna, wanna, wanna drop dibs on who, where you think that may be a later discussion that we may wanna have in terms of who you think comes out in that role, we'll maybe just leave it for Marcus. Uh, what's the, just curious, what's the, Kelvin, or you can even add in here, what's what's the vibe in the pit? Who, who does the pit think is going to come out on top in this battle? Well, I think that uh, Marcus is kind of on, on, I think he's on the right track because we, we've got an experienced team coming back with a lot of skill. So you don't need flash, you need consistency, and let's not forget now, Sean McKay was a winning quarterback at Garvey High School. Garvey High School is a premier program that generally year in, year out is in the state playoffs, right? And may, and, and I think one of those years they actually made it to state with him. Um, but 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 he can play. And um, and there's a lot of kids on that squad that was on that played with him in high school also. So he's a hometown kid. Uh, he has some some arm talent and, 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 and the, the number one thing about a quarterback is uh, you don't lose the game. You don't make mistakes. He's not a high turnover kid. Uh, he, he, he knows the playbook the best. So I think it's going to be hard to, to, to uproot him right now. Now I do, do I think that is 
more talent, some some folks with a little bit more talent, but potentially yes. But if you don't know the playbook, you don't you can't read the defense. Um, you know you can't handle you know fifty thousand fifty thousand fans in the stand, then it don't don't matter. So so I'm 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 rocking with McKay for now. All right, Kofi, you want you want to jump in? You want to add on that? Which side are where are you at? I think it's going to start out. I think it's going to start out with McKay. I think that's, that's the safe bet. Um, you know, but uh, I would say 2008, we had a scenario where we had two QBs uh, when Curtis Pulley first came in, um, came in. Uh, SAP is going to have an opportunity to, to play sometime this year. Uh, I, I believe that with my whole heart, just simply because he's just too good of an athlete to ride the bench. Now, uh, competition is good. And I think that it's going to make both QBs better. Um, McKay has the experience in the game versus a t which is no small feat. Um, going in, there was a lot of pressure during that game. Mm -hmm. And uh, to come off the bench cold and to be able to make the right decision with the ball um is exemplary uh that being said arm strength accuracy and heady play uh really go into qb play and with this system um it requires an ability to be able to uh to run a little bit and that's the missing element that ryan stanley did not have um really with his game mckay is a better athlete than um Ryan than Ryan Stanley, but Sapp is a better athlete than both of them. So um, I'm, I wouldn't be surprised to see both of them play uh, in alternating roles from time to time. Yeah, all right. It will be interesting to see what happens in a few weeks uh, when we head down to Miami Gardens to take on Jackson State. Lots of uh, we'll be we'll be tuning in practically every day. We'll be evaluating every pass and every seven on seven drill. I'm sure. Uh, Marcus, if uh, how can people follow you? How can they find you on social media? Because uh, when these, you know, obviously with, with you being so tied in, if whenever you're tweeting stuff out or posting something, I know Rattler Nation is going to want to follow. So go ahead and give out some plugs. Yes, uh, typically uh, my Twitter handle, I'm not on Instagram. Uh, my Twitter handle is at Decatur underscore G. I believe that's what it is. I'm so used to it. And you know, I just follow FAMU. I put out anything I see from, you know, school accolades uh, from the university. Mostly I got on Twitter just to follow the recruiting and then it's kind of expanded from there. But uh, at Decatur G underscore, uh, at Decatur underscore G. All right, there it is. At Decatur underscore G. And uh, look, we look forward to having you on some more. I mean, uh, obviously, you know, the, the information and the background, we love to be able to continue to talk. And, and you said you track more than just football. So obviously, you know, as we get going here and then as we get a little bit closer, even into basketball season, um, you know, we, we definitely want to kind of, you know, we, we, we have plenty to talk about. So uh, and, and there's plenty to talk about. So we will uh, we'll get into some more discussions um, as, as we go. So we appreciate you coming on, joining us. Uh, make sure you follow Marcus on Twitter at Decatur underscore G on Twitter. Make sure you let him know you appreciate his work and uh, keeping Rattler Nation up to date. And we follow Ooh. along the Rattlers. Yes, sir. Hey, we'll be back right after these words. Thanks for watching the ONG Strike Zone. Brian, Kelvin, Kofi, we'll be back right after these words. Let's go. Support the Black College Sports Network so we can continue to provide you coverage. Go to myjbn.com slash support and be a part of the Black College Sports Tell everybody Network. they can follow their dreams. Have you had your Earth Blend coffee today? At Earth Blend Coffee, we take pride in offering you the very best of beans across the world. Blended and roasted to perfection. Giving you superior quality and satisfying and flavorful taste. Experience the world in one cup with Earth Blend Coffee.
This is the Dean of the College of HBCU Sports, Kenyatta Cavill of Dr. Cavill's Inside the HBCU Sports Lab with Mike Washington and Charles Bishop. Come mix it up in the lab where the course lecture is in session every Tuesday from 6 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time on Facebook Live, YouTube, Spreaker, or the BCSN app. As we discuss all things about the HBCU sports culture, including exploring the week that was in the sporting HBCU dash as well as the upcoming week of HBCU Sports. With me, the Dean, the College of HBCU Sports, on Dr. Cavill's Inside HBCU Sports Lab with Mike Watts and Charles Bishop. Course lecture dismissed. Follow the Black College Sports Network on social media at MyBCSN1, the number one, on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at MyBCSN1. All right, we hope you enjoyed that last segment with Marcus Green. Uh, and, uh, you know, you got some information that's going to help you get a little better understanding. We're still going to be deep diving here in the upcoming episodes, uh, talking about some of the impact players that we think you need to be ready for. We might even talk a little bit about some of uh, the top impact transfers. I mean, we, we can talk about that all day. Uh, any final thoughts, uh, Kofi? Make sure to give the social media plugs. Let people know how they can reach out to you. Well, I'm on uh, Believe 365 on Twitter. And uh, you can also follow me on Facebook under Kofi Hemingway. I'm so excited. Uh, shoot, football camp begins on Friday. I am so elated. Football season is here. The NFL is going to be on with the Dallas Cowboys and the Pittsburgh Steelers on tomorrow. I'm excited about it. But on the real, man, Rattler football is here. And uh, we're excited about the orange and green battalion of death that's going to bring uh, just devastating uh, news to the rest of the swag. So I'm excited about it. Uh, well said. At Believe 365, make sure you go follow Kofi. Kelvin, what do you got? Yeah, I'm on Twitter, I'm at KB Rozier. And on Facebook, I'm Kelvin Rozier. And um, I'm really excited about the the fall and athletics. Um, I want to get get in and get a little get a little plug into the uh, volleyball program, probably coming up in in, in some of the auxiliary programs, uh, or the Olympic sports program too. Show them some love also. Definitely Absolutely. coming up for sure in the next episode. We will definitely hit up the volleyball program and let you let you all know they they've been they've been at, away from from the court just as long as the football program. So it's, uh, you know, I was just looking at uh, how their season ended, 500 season. They were actually preseason predicted to finish second in the MEAC before everything got shut down back in 2020. Uh, so we'll kind of get a, we'll find out what the anticipation is heading into the new conference uh, coming up on the next episode. And again, uh, you can find me on Twitter at DRB365. I want to encourage you, go send us, first off, make sure you're following us at ONG Strike Zone, uh, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook page is coming, promise. But you can also send us an email, ONG Strike Zone at gmail.com, and uh, let us know your thoughts. Any, any comments you want to share, anything you heard. Uh, anything you want to correct us on, you know, I I love constructive criticism. You got some, give it to us. We're all looking to try to make the show bigger and better every week. Uh, so that's going to do it. Uh, like, subscribe, wherever you're listening and watching. Uh, for Kelvin Rozier, Kofi Hemingway, I'm Brian Fulford. Thanks again to Marcus Green for joining us. Thank you for watching and listening to the ONG Strike Zone.